My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can help me and make a difference by either writing a review on iTunes or by simply making a donation. Today, for the second time in a row, my guest on the show will be sci-fi great PJ Manny. And uh, we are going to be discussing her most recent phenomenal book that just like blew my mind this past weekend called Identity. So welcome, PJ. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Fantastic. It's been long overdue and I've been uh, looking forward for your book for some time now. So um, let's start. And I should start perhaps first by saying that I recommend all of our viewers and listeners today go and check out the previous interview with uh, with you because it was fantastic and we covered a lot of topics not only your original book but for those who may have missed that if you were to introduce yourself in just a few words how would you do that i'm a science fiction writer i'm a futurist i'm a speaker and i am fascinated by the future of humanity <laughs> fantastic so um, where does science fiction writing fit within who you are and how? Well, I like to communicate my ideas through story. We hear a lot from some incredible futurists about where we're going, especially in terms of human enhancement and what defines humanity. But I like to tell it in story form because I think it sticks form. Uh, stories are stickier. We are homo narrative and... To be able to empathize with these characters makes us come to understand their predicaments and our possible solutions better. Excellent. So if you were to share with us what the Phoenix Horizon trilogy is all about, how would you do that? Well, it's the story of a very troubled man, <laughs> uh, Peter Bernhardt who later becomes Thomas Paine, uh, is a man set out for revenge. He's created some incredible brain technologies. Uh, a secret shadow government has tried to steal them from him, leaves him for dead, destroys everything he's ever known. And he comes back both to revenge them and to save, starting with the United States and the rest of the world, from the technologies that they plan to use for evil and not as so of medical technologies, uh, they're going to use them as mass propaganda and mass um, consent technologies. And you kind of gave us a quick rundown of, rundown of volume one of the trilogy. Uh, today we are discussing volume two. Uh, so let me ask you this. Do readers... Must uh, must our readers read the first one before they can read this one, or can they just jump and start? No, I really think they need to read the first one. Uh, it is set as a trilogy in chronological time. Uh, you can't just pull an episode out and and read it because you see the continuation of Peter Bernhardt, Thomas Paine as this first human cyborg not human, or is he still human? You know, uploads, downloads, he's turned into robots and other humans, and you, you see this change in him as the technologies evolve and the threats to him become even greater, where I think you would lose that sense of he started out as just a guy in Silicon Valley <laughs> and then turns into something that is beyond most people's comprehension. And now let me disagree just a tiny little bit with you here on this one, because I think you're so skillful and the, the second book sits so well on its own that, yes, I agree, it would be mighty helpful if people do it the right way and start with volume one and then move on to volume two. But I do think that if even if they break the rules and start by volume two, then the only risk of doing that is that then they're going to be hooked and they'll have to go read volume one <laughs> But they can totally do that. I think it's doable and I think both books uh, 
sit quite well on their own, even though they sit even better uh, as a continuity, one after the other. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, when I started, I, it's kind of like a, an open secret that I, I'm, I, I'm very myopic. So I, I have like minus seven and a half diopters and people usually don't know that, but my podcast listeners know about that because I've mentioned it before. So I'm severely short-sighted and one way to uh, diminish the strain on my eyes is by listening to audiobooks. And so when I started listening to your book, my wife overheard a little bit and she asked me, uh, why didn't PJ narrate her own book? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you have such an animated and such a, you know, artistic personality that you could totally have done that, she said. And I agree with her, even though, to be honest, your narrator did a truly phenomenal job. But but to my wife's point, you could have done probably equally good job yourself, wouldn't you? <laughs> no, I actually don't think so. First of all, I love David DeVries. He does a fantastic job. And, and the real challenge with David uh, and why he was chosen for the trilogy is I have so many different accents and languages and... He has so much to cover from all over the world, and bless his heart, he does the homework and he gets it right. In fact, uh, I am doing a reading uh, of a particular scene where Ruth has a good deal of Yiddish, and I'm actually listening to David to brush up on my Yiddish pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, and you have the the sudden droll female versus male voices, Yiddish, other accents, and. and Every one of them is done utterly authentically to the to where to what it's supposed to sound like. I, I agree. He does a phenomenal job. I also think there's something to the story. I mean, it, it's it's interesting because there's so many women in the story, but it still feels like a if I had to skew the story one way or the other, it feels like a more male story. I mean, not just because the protagonist is male, but the genre of of you know, action, techno thriller, science fiction still skews to a male audience, and I think the story. One of the reasons I I've gotten so much cut through with male readers is that it you know it, it they see themselves in it, and I think a male voice speaking since it's so point of view of Peter, Tom, you really need that male voice. I think it would. I think it does serve it. So. I agree with you, but but again, with with the little qualification that yes, I see what you're saying, and I can totally say it's like a can't put it down, uh, non-stop action page turner from the very beginning, sort of it grabs you by the throat till the very end. It's a torture, like it doesn't let you go. That book, your book, um, so I I can see all of that being true, but yet at the same time, you have three very strong female protagonist. I agree. Which is highly untypical of a science fiction novel. Usually you have probably one that, and especially in the sort of classic science fiction, you usually you had like one princess that gets to be saved by the character. And here you have three very strong female characters who keep saving the main character who is the character. <laughs> right? So it's kind of like the opposite. It's very sort of emancipated in that way. Um, I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> well, they do. They do constantly yes. either screw him up or they save him most of the time. <laughs> right. I mean, it's it, the thing is that as smart as he is, he can't know everything. And these women have remarkable skills and remarkable insight into him. Uh, in in many ways, the women in his life serve to illuminate the different aspects of of him, but also. He, they do. They save his ass on a regular basis, uh, and it's. And I hope that they are themselves fleshed out characters that the you know readers can identify with. Uh, when I wrote Revolution, the number of readers when I, I sent out a thing, you know, well, who's your favorite character? I was stunned how many people said Ruth was their favorite character, uh, um, and and I love that. Um, but I, you know, I, I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, and 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 you have even hackers as females, which is highly sort of against the stereotypes. I I would say, 
right? So usually it's it's like a teenage boy or or something like that. Like Adrian Lemo, who unfortunately recently just passed away, like last week or something, uh, at the age of 37 or 39 or something like that. So, oh. but anyway, that's... Yeah, so that's, you know, I, I, I was trying to go uh, for not just something different, but actually something... Veronica is actually based on a couple of people I know. So I wanted to bring that character and her characteristics to the surface. Mm -hmm. So before we jump into discussing your book, uh, let me just bring in another issue, which I think is in a way kind of connected with the topic. So let me see. If, um, so you have, uh, as I said, I was listening to the audiobook. And unfortunately, audiobooks nowadays have these DRM uh, protections. And so what happened was I received your book in the form of a CD. I put it on my computer because I don't own a CD player anymore other than my computer, which, by the way, is totally unique because most computers don't have CD players anymore. Right? Yeah. Anyway, so I loaded up all those MP3s there and then I was like, well, I'm going to put it all on my phone so that I can go and listen to it and in the car or anywhere or just lie down on the couch and put my headphones and be comfortable, you know, don't have to be in my office and all of that. And yet I got a message on my phone telling me that I didn't have the digital management rights, the DRM rights to play your book on my phone. That's ridiculous. <laughs> so, I know it's totally wow. ridiculous. So, so this is why... For example, people break the DRM, right? For for DVDs and, and CDs and, and Blu-rays. And, because you buy a perfectly legitimate, let's say, uh, DVD disc from Europe and you come to the United States or you do the opposite. You come to the US, you buy a movie, you go back home and you can't watch it because they have regional coding, right? You paid for it fair and square, you own it, and yet you don't really own it. And unfortunately... This is kind of the experience I had with your book. And I think that goes a lot with uh, the, some of the things that we're going to be talking later on about surveillance uh, and all kinds of other issues. So what do you want to say about that? Isn't it ironic, first of all? And secondly, it's terribly ironic. Um, I've had the same issues with my music player, which is uh, iTunes, Apple, where I have loaded methodically over years, and especially knowing how my books are created, and my character actually problem solves through music. Music is vital to what I do. And in the last big OS shift, it took all the CDs I had ever loaded and it destroyed everything. It dumped everything. And of course, what I had done was methodically put all of these CDs on my iTunes and then got rid of them because we were moving. And I thought, you know what? What a great space saving device. And now I have nothing. And uh, I railed and, you know, uh, I'm public in public for quite a while about that. And, and it is insane because what it's doing is actually taking not just what is ours that we have legally paid for that that is technically ours, but it's denying us the freedom to to basically keep our own data. Everything we're seeing right now is about we are data to the data companies, but we're not even allowed to keep our own data. We're not allowed to have our health data. We're not allowed to have our buying data. We're not allowed to know what kind of data has been sent by our social media through a variety of dating, data mining and manipulation services. So, of course, all of this and all of this does tie into the rest of the books in the sense that our data is being continually taken from us changed, manipulated. The story of Peter Bernhardt in identity becomes a completely different story because all the information is now digital and they can change all of those stories so that the world believes a completely different story about Peter Bernhardt and Thomas Paine. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to go really in depth into that because it's kind of very connected to some contemporary events that are unfolding as we speak today. But let's do that like one step at a time and just... <laughs> We're, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> One last note on the sort of the DRM issues. I recommend people read a phenomenal short, very short book by Cory Doctorow called um, Information Does Not Want to be Free, 
which has a lot on the topic of DRM um, and why, for example, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is trying to kill the DRM and why all of his books are issued uh, DRM-free and, and so on and so on. And how actually, because of DRM, authors end up losing rather than winning and it's the platforms or the publishers that end up collecting an unfair share. Anyway, so... Uh, Last time we spoke about we spoke about revolution. This time we are here to speak about identity. Those are the titles of the first and the second books of the trilogy. And I have to note that they're both spelled in a very funky, profound, deeply meaningful way as titles. Very original too. So let's start first with the title of revolution. Would it help if I held up the book, even though it might be reversed on the screen? Okay. So. Uh, so Okay. So here's here's Revolution. Yeah, there's the book. Ah. Um, and can you show the sites too, just to see people to see how massive it is too? Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's the book. <laughs> it's a thick book. <laughs> um, I had a lot to say. Um, and I will also tell you that my publishers were very happy. Well, they actually said to me I had to make a thinner book the next time. So I'm going to show the second book as well. So here's the cover of Identity. See, it's thinner. And there's the book. Um, so revolution has to do with the evolution and the re-evolution of man. Uh, we see this change in the protagonist. Uh, I like to describe the book as Frankenstein meets the Count of Monte Cristo, in that the creature and the doctor are the same person. Uh, so it's a revenge story like Monte Cristo, but it has this continual evolution of this character to a point where he becomes more than human. Uh, and in fact, maybe not even human, simply data. Uh, and then identity has the ID or id, uh, and the entity separated out. So you have this play between, you know, our, our desires, our, our, our wants, and who we are. And the whole book revolves around the sense of, well, who are we? Uh, who, is, who is Thomas Paine, Peter Bernhardt? Who are these other characters who go by aliases and other names and other uh, jobs? And everybody has, is presenting themselves in one way, but might be somebody else. And that search for identity. Uh, and also they get to define their identity. That's the other big thing in, in identity is they choose who they want to be. And they get to action that in ways that uh, are, are in some ways very familiar in our world, um, but in other, other characters, very unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what about the title of the third book that's forthcoming? So it's Conscience. I wish I had a cover to show you, but I don't. Uh, so it's Con Science. So against science, also the idea of a con. Um, this is something that follows through in all my books is, is the idea that um, both the bad guys and the good guys utilize these almost uh, stings and operations and pretending to be something they're not and trying to get something out of other people. So there's the con artistry, uh, but there's also this idea that, that has science gone too far? Have we taken this to a bad conclusion as opposed to the possible good conclusions? Uh, and what are we going to do about it? And, and, and having the conscience about having done all that. I mean, you know, especially Thomas Paine has unbelievable guilt about the unintended consequences that have have arisen from all of this work. Yeah, which there's always unintended consequences. Always. And and usually much worse than we ever expect. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Maybe Max, um, maybe Mark Zuckerberg feels a little bit like that uh, in the last few days, but we'll get back to that point <laughs> a little later. Um, <laughs> And, and and of course, the titles also represent the fact that your books are very multi-layered, multi-dimensional, that have touch points about 
of in, in many fields and many cross-pollinated ideas from, let's say, psychology to neuroscience to evolutionary biology to, you know, transhumanism, history, and so on and so on, sociology, uh everything, politics, of course, and so on. So let's focus, let's zoom down now on identity specifically. So what is identity identity about? So at the end of, con- sorry, at the end of uh, revolution, we have Thomas Paine in a new substrate. And uh, he lives as pure data. He's hidden on some server farms. And he's very disconnected from the world because he has no physical agency. He has no physical presence. And I do feel like um, our bodies do communicate. Even if you could create a digital simulacrum of the bodily hormonal exchanges that happen that make us animals and human, um, there's definitely a feeling in his character that he's... Not all of him, Uh, just enough, but not quite all. And he's woken from his reveries uh, of observing the world by uh, Doctor Who and the seastead she's living on come under attack and are destroyed. Doctor Who's kidnapped. So he has to figure out where is she? Is she alive? Um, This is a woman to whom he owes everything. And that starts the, the, the tale of how the club, who has not been destroyed, <laughs> spoiler alert, <laughs> uh, is basically getting back and taking advantage of the vacuum that has been left at the end of revolution. Uh, there is a vacuum of leadership. Uh, and as we know, where there is a leadership vacuum, corruption will rush right in. And so the the nation has split apart. It's a disaster from a, um, from a uh, Republic standpoint. Uh, And the, the characters soon realize they're in a prelude to something even bigger. So it really is the middle act of a three-act story, um, which is always tough um, because it's never a happy point. So the book can be very... (laughs) um, It can get pretty dark. (laughs) Let me just say that it was psychologically torturous and taxing and and to the end. (laughs) I was was hoping it's going to... Anyway, we'll we'll Read book three, read book three. (laughs) can't wait now now i'm like really cooked so i can't wait that's for sure um but so so you gave us an idea about the plot here but tell us a little more perhaps about the context the year and the timeline if you could sure so it's um a couple of years past the end of conscience um the there has been this period of time where basically the United States are no longer united. And so when Thomas Paine decides to jump back into action, uh, he's dealing with a, a chaotic culture and he's dealing with um, different parts of the country. And, they, they, you know, there's schisms, there's secessions, there's, there's all of this in these two years that he's, in essence, just been hanging out watching National Geographic videos. I mean, I hate to put it, you know, if you were this great mind, uh, but you also realize you really screwed up, you know, he, he withdraws in, in those two years and just takes in information. Constantly. And, he, and he's learning things, but he's also just, you know, please leave me alone. <laughs> uh, I've been through enough. Uh, he was through a lot in the first book. <laughs> So let me just unpack. You said the United States is no longer united. Uh, and by that, you mean that it's fractured? It's fractured. Yes. Yes. So, so there have been secessionist movements. There have been, um, uh, you know, I, so I'm... The biggest 
left over is the United Southern States, or how did you? So, Southern States of America. So, so yes, Southern States of America. So, I'm a American Studies major, American history specifically, and one of the things you learn in American history is that the cultural lines that were drawn from colonization have never ended. We still have, a, you know, if, if you look at every kind of measure from religion to politics to a variety of social levels, be it education, be it uh, divorce, be it violence, be it, you see these patches through time that completely correspond to the migration of the colonial peoples across the United States uh, from the 13 original colonies through what eventually became 50 states. And we're still in many ways fighting a civil war. We're in it right now. We're, we're at the beginning of a potential civil war. And that's no and laughing matter, by the way. It is no laughing matter. And that's a lot of what I'm writing about in it, what is now a future history. So revolution is, you know, maybe, well, the technology is far further in the future than I, than I would pop to in the books. In the books, there's an anachronism where I bring the technology much more close to just a few years in the future. Um, invasive brain computer interfaces are more years away than the book uh, says, but I wanted to deal with the here and now of how do we deal with this because we're already dealing with it in smaller, in small ways. And we can get back to that later. Um, so, so back to the idea of, of this fractured country. So when all the leaders and uh, are both revealed and destroyed and driven off and people are trying to take back their country, we find that different areas behave differently in, in this fracturing of the former United States. Um, and one of the ways that it happens is that the South coalesces as, you know, there's, there's numbers, there's, uh, there's culture, there's uh, all of that into the Southern States of America. Ideology, and religion, everything. <laughs> everything, everything. And, and again, I'm not, this is not a diss to Southerners or Southern states. This is history. And for 400 Your mom years. Is from the South too, right? My mom is from the South. Yeah. <laughs> My mom is from the South. And um, uh, yeah, so, but this is just, this is just history. You know, I'm, I'm looking at it from a very dispassionate point of view where you have to accept that different parts of the country have come from, come from different cultures uh, from the very beginning. Uh, the North came from a Anglo-Saxon Germanic culture, which believed that liberty and freedom were from the word free height, which has built into its context that freedom is a natural right to all mankind, that humans have the right to freedom. Whereas the South was colonized by the younger sons of the aristocracy. And they had a education, a neoclassical education at the time when they came over, uh, that emphasized that freedom for them was libertas. And libertas is a Greco-Roman concept, but really a Roman concept, that there is freedom for the citizenry, but not for everybody else. And the citizenry was actually a small group. Uh, everybody else, slaves, my bloodline, my bloodline uh, women, children, all male, and it was all free males, and it was all free males of great property. So that was it. And it fit in with the culture that they built in the South. So we're still dealing with that conflict, free height versus libertas, today, 400 years later. And this is the the point I'm making in identity, again, this is not a dis of, of one culture or another. It simply is. And yeah, let me grab out, let me grab one of the thoughts here. Uh, you're talking about how it's kind of a reflection of what we can see today and what we're struggling with today. And that kind of reminds me to Ray Bradbury, who 
um, in discussing uh, his Mars uh, science fiction novel, said that Mars is a mirror, not a crystal. Yes. In other words, science fiction is more about reflecting on the present and providing social and political commentary about it in sort of the, the, the veil of a fictional story postulated in the future. Which, by the way, as we discussed last time, is what Alexander Dumas did uh, back in his day when freedom of speech was not sort of, or was a very dangerous thing in, in France back in that period especially. Um, and how you modeled your book on first uh, The Count of Monte Cristo and then The Three Musketeers. Right, identities, three musketeers, and conscience will be shades of man in the iron mask. So, so tell us about that play about uh, sort of uh, not uh, a mirror, but uh, not a crystal, but the mirror. In other words, not about the future or somewhere else, but about the present here and now. So what I'm doing is taking all the things I'm seeing swirling around that have been, that are, and that I know will continue to be because culture is culture. Culture doesn't change unless massive change occurs, like the incursion of an entirely another culture that takes this culture over. And we are trapped within it and sometimes can't see ourselves. That's, I think that's the magic of science fiction, because the other thing is we're fish swimming in the water and we don't know it's water. And the job of science fiction writing is to show you the water. Wow. That's the, that's the entire point. That's what Bradbury did with Mars. Um, he took the, the nostal both the nostalgia and his fear of humanity and projected that onto an empty planet uh, where they were colonizers. I mean, they were actually, the ghosts of the Martians were still there. Um, so you still had this sense of them being destructive colonizers. It's wonderful. I, it, he's my hero, by the way. I, and I actually think uh, The Martian Chronicles is one of the great works of literature, period. Forget science fiction literature. And H.G. Wells, uh, his uh, War of the Worlds, again, was about colonization. And only this time, we weren't going to colonize Africa, say, but actually we were being colonized by the Martians, who were much more sophisticated, higher technology, etc., etc., than us. Exactly. So to have that ability in science fiction to both project out, so I am also writing a future of history on a trajectory I hope we don't take, um, but it is a, a, an alternate future history where if these things continue and we do not stop them or deal with them or come to some consensus about them, we're going to have problems like this. <laughs> Yeah, we may we may actually already be seeing some of those precursors uh, very seriously, but um, so yeah, I mean, you just gave me my favorite quote of of today, so I'm just like already blown away. Science fiction, uh, uh, how did you say it? You said we're all fish swimming in water, and the job of science fiction is to show us the water. So this is kind of like my new favorite quote from you. And last <laughs> time, by the way, the favorite quote from you was. Buddhism is a brain technology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I can give you some good quotes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm glad I you mean, can remember that... my quotes because I never remember anything I say. <laughs> well, I never remember mine if I have any. So, but, but this is how we learn. And, and, I, and this is because those are so very meaningful and kind of deep. And, and they pack a lot of substance in a very short uh, space. So that's why they're so powerful. They're like mini stories in a way, if you will. I mean, it, it is a story. I mean, when you think about the fish and the water and what science fiction is about, you have like the, the context, the setup, the story, even the, the combination and the goal, like, ev like wow, loving it. So um, let me talk a little bit about... Um, I, was it Nietzsche or Freud? I can't remember who said that all writing is ultimately autobiographical in nature. Because uh, we are talking about how science fiction is a reflection of the present. But is it also a reflection of our, our personal autobiographies? And we already talked about culture. So now let's just zoom down even more to the individual personal level. And I mean, in your book, uh, 
Amanda, for example, is a redhead. Uh, Peter uh, is modeled. Actually, Talia, Talia is a redhead. <laughs> was Talia a redhead? Yeah, Talia was redhead, yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry. So my, sorry, no, my it's okay. Talia, Talia, redhead. Okay, but Peter is also modeled uh, after your husband. So I'm just thinking there's like, there's parts of you, there's part of your husband, uh, there's lots of personal things. Tell us about how this works and why. Actually, Talia, um, one of my best friends is Belinda, and I actually modeled Talia on Belinda because she is also a redhead uh, who, you know, with the body of death. And, <laughs> uh, yes, so that's actually who that was modeled on. It was not me. Uh, however, um, sure, here's where the autobiography comes in. Uh, I'm obsessed with brains. I took a class with Robert Sapolsky when he was a very young uh, research scientist at Rockefeller University. He wasn't allowed to teach, so he illegally moonlighted at the new school where I was taking a summer class in human behavioral biology, and he changed my life. Like I, I, I knew I couldn't pursue neuroscience because I have dyslexia and dyscalculia, which makes it virtually dyslexia impossible. Dyslexia and what? Dyscalculia, which is the inability to, or, or the difficulty with numbers and numerical symbols, not just the alphabet. So I have, so once I got to calculus, I could only manage a semester because once I got symbols I'd never seen before, you know, I forget about it. So, uh, so I took this class, which was considered a super easy class that my college would accept. Um, and it was me and a bunch of Parsons art students who were also forced to take a science class from this guy no one had ever heard of before. And he was awesome. But what he did was really expand for me how brains work, how human behavior works, and getting down to the neuroscience of it. And I, I was hooked. So that's part of why I write what I write. Um, I also was a... Uh, American history major, so I'm fascinated, American studies, uh, I'm fascinated by the history of our country and how, you know, where it came from, where it's going. Um, the, because I'm a futurist, I spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley and with people from Silicon Valley. Um, very funny, I gave a talk at uh, UC Santa Cruz recently, and one of the faculty came up and sat next to me and says, I've read your book. I just have to ask why is everyone such a narcissist? I said, have you been to Silicon Valley? <laughs> and she went, I worked there for years. It's why I left. I said, then why are you asking me? So, <laughs> That's a great point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of it is personal experience. A lot of it is uh, the, you know, Peter Tom processing musically is my own daughter. Uh, but Peter Bernhardt is physically at least modeled on your husband. Physically. Yes, absolutely. But his mental because process. Because I met him. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that there is way too much over, of overlap yeah. here. <laughs> uh, but his mental process and how he processes musically is really based on my daughter. And uh, so, so, yeah, you know, there, it is autobiography. You, you, you know the old joke, write what you know. Um, so I'm writing what I know in a sense. Um, however, as to other writers, I just want to say, never just write what you know. Go out and learn something. Uh, I taught myself neuroscience for these books. I learned all about the world of brain-computer interfaces. I got to meet the scientists. I got to really investigate you know, where I believe this stuff is going by doing firsthand research, reading the papers. Because I was going to ask you, how do you write about the the sort of the super evil characters that last time we discussed were modeled and after probably Brzezinski and Kissinger and so on. So that's the history angle, I guess. It's the history angle. Um, also, uh, I've known some pretty scary characters in my life. So pulling some of those people out as, um, and maybe not as scary as, let's say, Carter turns out to be an identity. Um, but I have known my fair share of narcissistic sociopaths. And I live, I live and work in Hollywood, right? Um, 
so there's a real, um, I just watch people. I'm fascinated by people. I'm fascinated how they, they, they function. Um, so much as we had said earlier is based on some of the real issues that are happening within technology in Silicon Valley. Um, I, I understand how people work and I'm not afraid to talk about it. I'm not an optimist about human nature. Again, we talked about last time, optimism and pessimism. I'm a realist. You know, there are people who are wonderful and there are people who are horrible and we're only lucky as a species that we have slightly more nice people than bad people. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's really an issue in our species and I just accept it. It is what it is. Um, and I try to convey all those types within the books. Now, let me ask you something about this because, uh, you say you, you like observing people and learning about people. So, uh, Peter Bernhardt has become Major Tom, which is basically an uploaded human intelligence, which is now sort of a human artificial intelligence, if you will. Um, and yet, as you said in the beginning of our conversation, he decides to withdraw and spend a couple of years basically watching the National Geographic. Not exactly, but kind yes, of like but yes, exactly. observing sort of the world. civilizational voyeurism, if I can call it this way. I don't oh, know. It's actually great. It's a great phrase. But but uh, it and it turns out he was or is maybe still even a little depressed. So how does how do you depress or how does an, a human artificial intelligence, that's to say a mind upload, get depressed and or why? Can you explain that a little? How does that work? It's a little bit of a spoiler because in the book he discovers that he he has been artificially depressed and. Uh, now Ruth is genuinely depressed, um, because she's not being utilized to her full advantage and he's depressed. So she's depressed and it's that classic relationship cycle of, you know, that, that you mirror each other. Um, but we discover that major Tom has been artificially depressed by Carter and the bad guys and didn't even realize that he had been infiltrated. He thought he was in control of all the artificial intelligences under his control, which included Carter and Josiah and Bruce and all, you know, and, and the, the chief baddies that get uploaded along with him at the end of revolution. Um, now in identity, he's living in a memory palace with these entities, but he thinks he's in control but he's really not. And he's been artificially depressed and kept back because over these two years, I was trying not to do the spoiler. Thanks, honey. Uh, <laughs> bad. Um, I was just trying to, to figure out more like the mechanism. How would it right. work? So what, what, what we discover is that he's actually been artificially depressed within his own construct, that they've made a copy of his construct and depressed him. And it's a, it's only when they now need him to attack them because now they're creating a narrative. The entire book of identity, when you talk about creating your, your identity, they're also creating a narrative. So the bad guys have discovered that narrative is the most powerful weapon that exists. And they're going to use Major Tom and his iterations as robots and humans as the bad guys in their new narrative. So they need him active. They need him angry again. They need him betrayed. They need him in his old self to go out there and kick ass because they're going to take the bits of that story and turn it into a narrative where he is the greatest evil on earth. And this is so amazing at so many levels because, you know, I have been switching my attention to narrative for the last one, one and a half years. Um, I even did a little experiment at an art exhibit in Switzerland where I published a little booklet called Rewriting the Human Story, How Our Story Determines Our Future. And sort of I'm kind of experimenting and I want to take it to the next level and sort of if I can go beyond the transhumanist narrative and and how were we if we were to write a new human narrative because as the context changes, the narrative must follow and must change. And, and so... 
the context has already changed around us, but we haven't found new narrative. And that's one of the reasons where the gap starts getting bigger and bigger. So, uh, and so that's what I've been struggling with at the sort of the personal level, but also on the other hand, take it even further. Now we see what in the book you called the weaponization of narrative. Uh, with the most recent revelations around uh, Cambridge Analytica, which are unfolding as as we are speaking right now, and I actually have a a, a sort of longish op-ed piece coming on that. But talk to me about that, about the importance of weaponization of narrative, and because I think in a way you were very prescient with your book. Uh, you probably wrote it a year ago, maybe longer. Longer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so two or three years ago you wrote it, and then right now we kind of start seeing what for you was kind of science fiction literally tool or plot unfold in real life with the help of technology such as Facebook, but also YouTube and Google search, and which were cleverly employed to manipulate people to change their minds and take action during the last presidential election in the United States of America, but maybe even in Brexit uh, in the United Kingdom and God knows however many other places around the globe, because that company has uh, um, uh, contracts with governments and, and organizations around the globe. They've already said that two of the elections in Kenya were influenced. So, I mean, that's just Kenya. We've got, they'll, they'll, there will be dozens and dozens more. I've said this repeatedly in social media. We're at the beginning of this. People think that, that this is the story. This is not the story. The connections are so deep on this and had to be. And that was, from my point of view, that was the logic of it. I knew this was ha had to happen. Not that it was happening necessarily. I knew it had to happen. And interestingly, I don't really deal a lot with social media in my books. And it was something that I kind of did consciously because I always felt that the infiltration of weaponized narrative, that social media would just be like the beginning. It would be a side story. I actually think the, the weaponization of narrative is so beyond social media. It, it's going to, it infiltrates every moment of our day, every time we have any outside communication through any kind of media, through any kind of political action. It, it's, it's so profound that to write about social media in a science fiction book, it, it just seemed dated and petty. And, and I, I actually think people, this wave we're seeing Facebook, we're going to see the people retreating from social media until they can find things they think they can trust. And, you know, this is this, Facebook and, and, and Twitter and all the rest. These are blips on a, on a, on a chart. These aren't world changing forever things. The world changing is that we have the ability to make the connections. That's the world changing. The actual companies and what they are or are not capable of and their engines for profit making, which of course has to be us, you know, if it's free, you're the product. Um, the engines can infiltrate anything, any news, any communication, any interaction. And that's the thing I think people don't get. Yeah. Maybe you can unpack the meaning because people uh, are still going to be probably unclear. What do you mean and what is it uh, when you call something the weaponization of narrative? What, what is that? Okay, so in traditional warfare, there's always been propaganda, right? We, you know, leaflets over the, the other side Truth of the front. the first victim of war. Exactly. Truth is the first victim of war. There's propaganda everywhere, both within the country that is waging the war. You know, we've always been in, at war with Oceania. Uh, and uh, the propaganda we send overseas to try to change hearts and minds, whether it was Radio Free Europe, whether it was Tokyo Rose. I mean, every side is doing it. There's either, there are no, there are no, uh, pure heroes here. Everybody's throwing whatever they've got, whatever psychological warfare they've got. So this has been done forever. What we have now that's new is the ability to deeply change the data record. And one of the things I posit in identity, 
one of, okay, so I'm going to backtrack and come back and finish this. And you know how I do it. Uh, so, <laughs> so one of the things I deal with a lot, and we can come back around and talk about that later, is the blockchain and cryptocurrencies and, and the rest. And I say they're not safe because nothing is safe. Everything is corruptible. There is nothing that is either not damageable or corruptible. It simply doesn't exist. And while the theories behind, you know, well, it's going to be very hard to, to alter blockchains and very hard to, to alter cryptocurrencies, no. It, it's a lovely, it's like saying, you know, our currency, forget crypto, our American currency is strong. It's, it's an agreed upon fairy tale that we all agree that this is how it works. Um, that's what currency is. That's what money is, period. History of money. So we think in the future we're going to be able to stabilize our stories by throwing them on a blockchain. Like we're going to say, well, no, this is what really happened. Here's history. Let's put it on the blockchain. I'm saying that why can't that be corruptible too? Because everything is corruptible. And The idea that you can take, now take history as it's being made, which even then is having to, being tweaked. Every side is saying, well, you know, this event happened. Well, one side says it means this. The other side says it means that. But what if you could now take history and say, that never happened at all. That simply did not happen. Now, we're going to be able to take this as a weapon. We're going to change other our enemy's history. We're going to change our own history because we need our citizenry to behave a certain way. Or we need another country's citizenry to behave a certain way. We want them to vote a certain way. We want them to think a certain way. We want to instill them with fear because fear creates a very specific psychological pattern. Or we want them to be incredibly content because that creates a different psychological pattern. And we need to manipulate that. So narrative we, again, are homo narrative. We are wired to think in stories. We actually can't not think in stories. Everything we look at in the world, we think is causal. If A, then B equals C. Even if it's random events, we try to put a causality onto it to make sense in our heads. Because if it doesn't make sense, we throw it out. So narrative is the deepest, single most powerful thing we have, most powerful tool to get inside people's heads because it's literally how we're wired. If I can manipulate your story, I can manipulate you. And we're seeing it today. Now, I take it to its next step, which is it's not enough for people to send stories that make people afraid to vote for the other guy and yada yada. I'm telling you that history never happened. And I'm giving you a new history that did happen. And you're going with it. You're thinking, wow, did I misremember that? Yeah, and the reason why we're going with it, or I mean, there's many reasons, but one of the reasons is that you make it very coherent and logical in your own right. But the other reason is that there's actually real events unfolding as we speak, which could be the precursor of what you're talking about in your book. Because it's the same technology, it's the same skill, it's the same tools. It's basically behavioral science, micro-targeting, data analytics, uh, and all of those, and neuroscience, uh, and big data, and all of those put together with smart algorithms and machine learning technology and, and so on. So, and, and we see the results. So, uh, yeah. And, and as we can see, the sky's the limit. We're talking referendums, we're talking presidential elections, we're talking basically <laughs> fundamental, you know, civilization-wide decisions. <laughs> well, and you also have to remember we are in these cycles of history that, you know, we're not in the 1930s per se, but it rhymes, is the, is the classic cliche. Yeah, tell me a little more about those Clio dynamics, you call them, right? Yes. So I'm a fan of a methodology of looking at history called cleodynamics. It was developed by a number of people, but probably the lead person that most people know about is uh, Dr. Peter Turchin at University of Connecticut. 
And he and a group of not just historians, these are data analysts. He actually started out in uh, biological statistics. So he was studying ecosystems and he was looking at how, you know, the predator prey cycles, feast famine cycles, uh, climate change, you know, all of these things which would change an ecology. And often on a nice curve, you know, you, you see in these, these predator prey, climate, et cetera, feast famine cycles, that there's actually a, a cycle. Uh, it, it, it isn't just doesn't come out of nowhere. I mean, yes, you can have, you know, oh my gosh, ice age, that, that will throw a spanner in the works uh, of your ecology. But for the most part, um, th there are relatively regular cycles. Um, so a number of scientists started thinking, well, hold on a second. We're animals. We have feast famine, predator prey, all kinds of regular events. Let's start getting as much historical data as we can from disease, food resources, weather, uh, history, warfare, uh, cultural cycles, every cycle they could come up with, anything they could find, every bit of data. And they started plugging it into this giant model. And the model came out with some very beautiful sine waves. And that was the shock, that it was, yes, there again, something can throw a spanner in the works, which sets everything off a little bit, but then it just, is, in essence, it's just resetting the system, and then the system keeps going. And these, these cycles are about, on average, 50 years, from 40 to 60 years. And one of the key things that he talks about is what's referred to in clear dynamics as elite overproduction. So that's the time where, and tell me if this rings a bell, we have great political turmoil because we have many people scrambling up the greasy pole. We have great income inequality. Education becomes very expensive because everybody thinks, wants it because they know they don't get it. They're not going to get, period. We have huge polarity in politics where our ideas of conservative and liberal become so skewed to the edges that there's no dialogue in between. Uh, we have a sense of scarcity, even though we may not actually have scarcity, but we've created our own scarcity because of this, these, these inequalities. And these happen regularly in history. Again, every about 50 years. And this period is often punctuated, sadly, by warfare. Warfare resets the system to start again. Or revolutions or social upheaval and so on. Exactly. Because civil, war. civil wars, what all civil wars are is that the elites want what the other one has. And one side of the elite says, we want to control the country. The other side of the elite says, we want to control the country. And they have a fight. And, and that's at that point of elite overproduction where there are just too many people who want to be the head of whatever it is. And we only have so many seats at the table, right? It's musical chairs. We've got 100 senators, you know, 500 whatever Congress people. We've got only so many, you know, we've got seven judges, Supreme Court judges. We have one president. Um, you know, there, and there's only a Fortune 500 if you're, you know, like that's it. And there are only so many seats at the various elite tables, only so many seats on the stock exchange, blah, blah, blah. So everybody's fighting over them right now. And that's where we manufacture these fractions within our society. And they take those societal fractions that I was talking about before that have existed since the beginning of the first colonists and their differing ideologies. And we set them poles apart that there's no cooperation, there's no consensus, there's no conversation, there's no negotiation. We're at each other's throats. And we've had this several times in our history. Also, it's an increase in political violence this is the same during the same period. And you can see these, these graphs in clear dynamics. Boom, 40 to 60 years, political violence, like, like clockwork, because the elites are trying to assert their power. 
categorizes authoritarianism, all of it. This is an old story that has a, an actual almost biological impulse, uh, but also a, a, a psychological impulse because the reason it's 40 to 60 years is it takes two or more generations to forget what asses we were the last time. Well, let me ask you this, though, because it sounds like despite our alleged progress in civilization and education and advancement and history and all that, we're still not so smart after all. If we're still so animalistic, so predictable, so slaves of biology, so uh, manipulate, so pliant to manipulation and, and all of that. Yeah. Then not only that, so that's sort of at the civilization-wide level, but even if you take it to the, the sort of the character level of, of uh, and connect it to, the, to, to your main protagonist, Major Tom, I mean, he's a human artificial intelligence. He's an uploaded mind, and he behaves like he's not, like, he's also human in a way. He, he's not even very smart. He makes stupid mistakes constantly. His plans are constantly being thwarted or predicted. Uh, or, and the, the bad guys or the other guys are always one step ahead of him. So he's also human in the end of the day. Absolutely. Um, well, there, there are two issues with that. Um, one is if he knows everything can do everything, that would be a very boring book. <laughs> uh, the other thing is he doesn't have, for all of his intelligence and more than human intelligence in many ways, he isn't the kind of person who would think about that and go there. It isn't his first psychological assumption, but it is. Well, if you're a narcissistic sociopathic leader, member of the elite, it's exactly where you go first. You know, if we were just, if we we're going to talk to anybody in power right now and said, okay, here's the situation. Where would you go next? Hello, they're doing it already. Um, so there is still the, a fundamental from the very beginning of the book, but there's still a fundamental naivete. Again, he's cynical. But I don't even think he can believe where they will go, what they're capable of doing. I mean, really, any good person wouldn't. And it's a, call it a failure of imagination on his part. But I find it common to so many people in the world today who say, that can't be, that can't be right. It could never happen that way. Who would do something like that? Hello. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that makes him so much more endearing and sort of uh, easier to associate with because he is a lot more human than, let's say, his uh, antagonists in, in many ways. So he's the mind-uploaded AI, or he was the first one anyway, the big one, the smartest one, all of that. And yet he's a lot more human and stupid and, and, and flawed, if you will, uh, than his uh, antagonists. Yes, absolutely. Because they will not be deterred. They have a single-minded, again, single-minded in a way where the consequences are meaningless to them. They just need to, to achieve what they want to achieve. And anything that gets buried or destroyed along the way is simply collateral damage. There is no, uh, there is no morality to this. They're amoral people. Mm -hmm. And let's talk a little bit about the importance, because we talked a lot about, well, we talked about clear dynamics and biology and psychology, but, and, and how those have sort of major, if not determining sort of factor in our behavior, both individually and collectively. But yet on the other hand, you're pushing the line that we all have choices that Major Tom has made his choices, keeps making those choices, just like all the, the other characters around him. And unfortunately, you know, and, and they're always well-intentioned, and unfortunately, they pretty much always end up kind of with a major disaster screw-up every single time. <laughs> uh, 
but yet we have choices. So can you talk to us about that tension behind, on the one hand, you have clear dynamics and biology and psychology, which are sort of evolutionary factors, if you, if I may call them like this, uh, unchanging and arguably unchanging and unmutable, perhaps. And on the other hand, we have our own individual choices where supposedly our individual freedom lies, or does it? So I'm not saying that clear dynamics is a fatalistic uh, discipline. In fact, quite the opposite. What you see in history is while the, the, the sine curve is maintained, there are shallower lows, shallower highs, depending on the choices that a polity makes, that an empire makes. Uh, for instance, one of the best choices we ever made as a country was electing FDR at a point in history where a lot of authoritarians were presenting themselves as the answer. And we ended up in a war of, of non-authoritarians against authoritarians, in essence. Um, whereas today, we chose the authoritarian. <laughs> and now we have to undo that um, because people are naive and do not realize where that goes. They think, well, this is America. It could never happen here. It happens in every empire throughout history, and we're no, we're, no, we're no different and we're not immune. It's just this is where I'm talking about we have not only our personal choices as the things we choose as an individual, but we also have social and collective choices about where we, the vision we see of our culture going. And right now we're being manipulated by a variety of forces to not come to the table together and have those conversations. And what when that choice was made in, you know, 1932 in the United States, the choice was, let's come to the get table and we'll all work this out. And, you know, we know we've got issues. Let's figure it out. And, and let's experiment and try things, but always with a mind that we have everybody at the table, that we're not excluding entire parts of our culture. The New Deal. The New Deal, exactly. And um, so that was a case where, while the cycles of history were still running, this country made a very smart choice. It didn't stop war from happening. It didn't stop, it, but at least we weren't with the Axis, right? <laughs> Burying the UK. I mean, that, that would have, you know, these are the things you, you know, or we would have just sat it out completely and watched Europe fall into you know, disaster. So, so there, there are all these things that, that as individuals, as collective groups, you know, within society, we do have choices. We can make choices. And those choices are crucial. And it's actually literally my mission in life to talk about what's coming because people think what exists now is how it's always going to be. People in general, don't really think about the future except one or two steps ahead. They don't actually think about, well, what is that social media thing going to do? Or what is that brain computer interface going to do? Or, you know, what is any of the technologies that you discuss all the time going to do? And we need to start making decisions now. I mean, we're shutting the, the barn door after the horse is bolted with Facebook. You know, oh, we're going to talk about legislation and regulation and Hello. <laughs> um, and I don't believe that everything needs to be regulated or legislated, but there had to be certain pressures brought to bear on companies that say, we're going to lie to you wholesale and tell you we're taking care of your data when we're in fact, we're not. We're going to lie to our own employees and say, don't ask, don't look too deeply into that. You don't want to know. Um, you know, all of this, we're going to find this out with every company. Every company that's been dealing with our data as a commodity. So these are what I talk about, the choices we need to make, the pressures we need to put on corporations, uh, legislators, to be smart, proactive. You know, this is the problem with politics. Politics is always shutting the door, the barn door after the horse is bolted. Politics is a reactive, not a proactive 
action. And most politicians and judges have no idea what reality is right now, no less in the future. You know, we've got judges on the bench adjudicating tech, uh, you know, tech um, trials, but have no idea what the tech actually means. Some of them, don't, I was reading, some of them don't even receive emails occasionally. Like, right, you, you read some of these people. Some of them are so old and like so like stuck in their ways. They don't even know how to use emails. Well, I don't think old is the issue because I know plenty of old people who keep up with everything. I think people who do not keep up with everything, I don't care what age you are, you're in trouble because we're, our, everything's accelerating. We know this. You know, change is accelerating so fast. And, you know, I always end some of these things with hang on because hang on, it, things are going to get crazy. Well, it's a very important conversation that uh, we need to have, which is why I bring you here, because I hope the two of us will be part of that conversation. And we see what the stakes are with the current revelations around Cambridge Analytica. Um, but so let me ask you this. What was the biggest surprise? perhaps, or lesson that you learned in the process of writing the second novel? There are probably a few lessons. Um, number one, second acts are hard. <laughs> number two, uh, and, and, and Debbie Downer stories are very hard um, because you need to leave people with a sense of hope that they're going to rally and figure this out. But you know, I, I leave you with a man, a woman, and a small child. <laughs> oh, and an older woman and another guy. Pretty much that's, you know, against the empire. <laughs> it literally is like the lineup of, of at the end of, of empire. It's like, you know, oh, golly, but at least they've got like ships and stuff and other people who fight with them. Um, I've left you I with... the empire strikes back. Right, exactly. I've literally just left you with like, you know, five... Five people and one of them's a child, <laughs> a baby. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I I think that um, second acts are hard. What surprised you? What was the most surprising thing? How dark I could get. <laughs> that was not the most surprising thing. I, I, I can get pretty dark. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if there was a surprising thing. I wish I could say there was. How do you separate yourself when you're writing a, a sort of a dark uh, second act of a trilogy? How do you not get depressed by your own writing? Uh, how do you... I don't know, compartmentalize or, or don't let it seep into your own life. Because I was uh, reading somewhere about uh, Ingmar, Beg Ingmar Beg Bergman, and he was saying how in his later life, when he was older, he would literally get depressed by watching his own movies. <laughs> <laughs> Which was, would, would have been very easy, because a lot of his movies are really depressing. <laughs> um well, I'll tell you, you know, my, my husband and kids laugh at me, but I actually don't try to watch really depressing things. I don't consume a lot of depressing media, um, all, except, except news. Um, I, you know, it's, it's all nonfiction that you probably think is depressing. I am the queen of the movie musical. Um, and uh, I have my go-to comfort films or TV shows, you know, uh, while I was sick and trying to write uh, recently, I binged Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee. I watched oh, every I that one. single episode. Uh, and I really love it because of the process. You know, a lot of the younger comics, the interviews don't have a handle on process because I think, A, they're not so introspective yet. B, they're maybe afraid if they share a process, like it's trade secrets and the magic will go away. Uh, but when he gets with the with the old timers, Steve Martin, Rickles, uh, oh my God, my favorite is the uh, Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner episode. 
Um, and they actually are talking process, although I think also the Steve Martin episode may be my favorite. Um, and what makes funny and the evolution of their careers and the evolution of their funny. And that to me is the greatest thing I could watch. Uh, then I started binging on comedian documentaries because comics have this incredible immediacy, but not. So you think they're just telling you the story, but they've been honing the story. In some cases, the same stories for years. And I love that moment in Steve Martin where he's actually talking, you know, they, he says a line and then Seinfeld says, well, it might be funnier if you say this, they say it this way. And then Martin says, well, maybe we take out these two words. And you're watching two masters create. That's what keeps me sane is knowing that others are out there with their creative processes, processing all this crap around them and knowing that no matter what happens, they've got their heart. <laughs> Seriously. I actually think that that's, um, that's what keeps me going is, is watching people in their process. Um, and seeing how it comes out the other end. Um, I have a real burden with conscience because on one hand, I've, as you know, at the end of, of identity, I've, I've set myself up quite a little thing I have to deal with, uh, which is a war. And how is that going to play out so it isn't just one bleak, awful thing after another? And also that we have a happy ending. So there's going to be a happy ending, I promise. Uh, <laughs> but it may not be the kind of happy ending that people expect. And uh, if it was, then I failed. Uh, <laughs> so I think that's, you know, for me, it's about process. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you the biggest surprise for me was... Uh, uh, seeing that Singularity Weblock was actually mentioned in the novel. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the chapter 16 or 17 or somewhere there. I, I have no idea where it is in the book, but I love that you're like, hmm, 16, 17. Because <laughs> uh, I have the audio MP3 files, right? And it's, oh, it's right. number 16, but it's not exactly by chapters there because some, some files go over the same chapter or something. So it's somewhere there, 16 or 17 MP3 file from the beginning. But I was, I was amazed. Thank you for that. You're welcome. I, lo I love to give a good shout out. <laughs> Um, let's see, um, uh, I, as you know, a lot of my audience are transhumanists. So is it fair to say that your trilogy is a transhumanist trilogy? Sure. Absolutely. Um, I, yeah, by anyone's definition, including mine, uh, which is of course different than everybody else's. Which is what specifically? Well, I, I Inherent in most people's definition of transhumanism is this sense that the change that makes us transhuman is coming in the cyborgization of uh, humanity. I believe we've always been transhuman and that all tools have made us transhuman. And now we're just taking those big tools, you know, levers and pulleys and et cetera, that made us stronger and faster, you know, wheels that were outside of ourselves. And now we're just putting them inside of ourselves. Uh, and We've been transhuman since glasses, since clothing, since anything that made us smarter, faster, warmer, colder, more efficient, whatever regulated us that, that served a purpose is part of a transhuman technology. And I just find it really hard to believe that there's a line in the sand out there that we step over and go, we were transhuman. Um, my cell phone makes me transhuman. You know, it's the third lobe of my brain. If I didn't have it, I couldn't function. Uh, or I could function just in a diminished capacity. And this is really the, the key to this, um, that all of these technologies do this. Do you think, though, that uh, sort of the word transhumanism is kind of coming back into the jargon and even going into, uh, as of recently, politics and so on? Um, yes, but 
not necessarily in a constructive manner. Um, so, for example, I interviewed last 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 episode. I interviewed uh, David Wood, who wrote uh, this book, uh, fantastic book called uh, Transcending Politics, and he makes a, a he starts the book with a claim that there is no escape that uh, basically to survive and thrive in the 21st century, we transhumanists and others will have to uh, fix politics. We, we can't do it without politics. Uh, and therefore, he says that it's inevitable and it's unavoidable that transhumanism and transhumanists will have to get involved within and confront politics. Absolutely. No question. The problem is who are our representatives going to be? And in the past, we've had some extremely flawed uh, representatives that actually don't, to me, represent transhumanism at all. Um, I think that a lot of the publicity mongers don't do real transhumanists any favors because we have to deal with people who for whom these ideas are quite new. Even though they're living with cell phones and going to have certain, you know, transhuman surgeries, they don't think of themselves that way. And even though they'd like to live a nice long time, they don't think of themselves as, you know, chasing longevity or immortalists, et cetera. So, you know, they have their own cultures to deal with to, to mediate these ideas through. And I think within each culture, we need individuals who represent the best of these values, but at the same time are just like you and me, you know, you know, to, to make it a freak show makes us a freak show. And I think that's, you have to actually understand politics. And unfortunately, some of the people who claim to represent us have no clue how politics actually works. Um, Next week, I'm interviewing the uh, the head of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. And who's that? What kind of Gennady Stolyarov? Oh, okay. Uh, so, what what kind of questions or issues do you think I should pose to him, or or what's a question if you could ask him a question or something? How do you see? Do you see transhumanism as a single issue as a party? Or do, you, or do you see it, and I would highly recommend that he does, transhumanism as a pervasive thing that just is who we are at this point in history and in culture, and that everything comes from this notion that we are becoming more than what we were in previous millennia, and that it isn't specific transhuman, I want to live forever, I want, you know. Everybody wants to live a long and happy life. They don't want to live very long if their life is crap, right? They want to live long and happy lives, functional lives. They want to be fed, clothed, sheltered, taken care of. They want their health care dealt with. They, suddenly we're actually in politics, right? This isn't just transhumanism. This is politics. And I really want anyone who has aspirations in the transhumanist community to start thinking in terms of what everyone wants. What is the promise of transhumanism, which is simply better lives. So what does that entail? Mm -hmm. Bring it down to a level that everyone can understand. Riding around in a coffin bus does not sell our brand. And this is the most important thing I can, I can say to people is if you want to talk about these things with the average person, then you better know how the average person thinks. And the thing with transhumanists is we're not average. We, we think these wacky thoughts and, you know, and we, we do these strange things like write science fiction books. Um, you know, you want to talk to healthcare providers, right? Transhumanists are all about health. You want to actually get in with, well, you know, what's the economy going to look like? What are the various options? What's going to pay for all of this? You know, again, now we're talking politics. So please, I beg of 
everyone who thinks they want to get into politics to actually think like politicians. Stop thinking like transhumanists. Good politicians, not bad politicians. Good, <laughs> I was going to good, say just Good that. politicians. No, and there are good politicians. They actually are. Um, there are people who care and who want to, to leverage their power and ability to do good things. Be those people. PJ, we've been talking for nearly 90 minutes now, so unfortunately we'll have to uh, bring our conversation to an end pretty soon. But let me ask you just one last question on, on your second book. How long did it take you to write that one? Much less time than the first book. <laughs> uh, it took, well, yeah, it took, it took about 18 months, two years. It should have taken less, but dealing with both personal and family health issues. Uh, so I always think I can crank them out faster than I can, but sadly, that's not the case. Uh, same with conscience. Conscience, conscience will, be, will come out next year as opposed to this year uh, because of, again, family and, and personal health issues. So uh, we're, you know, we're, we're trucking along. Okay. And uh, what's next for PJ? Uh you said we can expect uh, Conscious next year. Yes. How about movie rights, perhaps? Because you are from the movie business. And this time, I don't think, I'm not sure if you said it in the beginning. I don't think you did. But you have lots of experience from TV serials such as Xena, uh, Xena the Warrior Princess or Hercules and so on. Uh, and you have lots of production. So next year, I will I will start pursuing because most people like to see all three books if they're going to buy a trilogy. It's nice to, it's nice to know where it's going. Uh, so I'll start doing that next year. Um, also, uh, just thinking about the next things I want to write. Uh, also thinking about more speaking, more consulting, um, really having a great time talking about storytelling, weaponized narrative, uh, power of empathy, all of the things that I do explore in my novels, but I really want people to start thinking about in a more uh, nonfiction, more policymaking, and a more personal actualization area. Because mm -hmm. I, I recently watched uh, Altered Carbon on Netflix, and uh, I don't know if you saw it, but I... Not yet. Uh, I, I thought it was well done, and I thought, actually, I... I, I can see something like that out of your trilogy. Yeah, I, I, I actually see it bizarrely as a limited series, you know, that it's a, uh, it's a mini series of some sort. And um, uh, yeah, I can't help but think in cinematic terms, especially for the action scenes, because that's how I was trained to think. Uh, so that's my, um, yeah, that's my thing. Um, but also, I think it would be a lot of fun well, I think it would make great TV. I I agree. It, it would great. It would make a great movie, not not just TV, but even in the theaters, um, because you have a great story. That's the key. The key is you have a great story, and then the medium. If you have a great story, you can tell it in a diversity of mediums. So, it it I think you can read it on a page. You can listen to it as an audio book. You can see it on a TV screen or in a big screen. Uh, it it can live everywhere, in my opinion. Um, so last two questions. Where can viewers and listeners find more about you and your work? Uh, my website is pjmanny.com. I'm, I'm on social media. Uh, <laughs> uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, Plus. though I'm not there very often. Um, I have tons of videos on YouTube, lots of videos now. So just Google PJ Manny, but I also have a couple of channels of both uh, some, some uh, futures in a minute. I do a little one minute thing every so often of uh, questions that people send me uh, about what I think. And now I think I'm also gonna go out and just start doing a little more one minute, two minute segments. Um, so yeah, I'm all over. You just have to Google PJ Manny or, or type in pjmanny.com. But I think starting with book number one and then following with book number two is the best way to do it. I think that would be awesome. <laughs> uh, okay, so we've been talking today for 92 minutes, and I always enjoy our conversations. But if we were to take away the most important thing 
from our conversation today in a single sentence or two? What would you like that to be? Do not be complacent. Do not think that the world and history moves without you. Everyone has a voice and we need to use it right now. PJ Mani, thank you very much for being with us on Singularity FM today. Thank you so much. It is always a pleasure. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. 